Our presenter today is Konstantin Pimenov, a regulatory compliance specialist at Chemadvisor. Konstantin is a native of Russia. He graduated from Perm State University in his hometown with a degree in chemistry. After graduation, he worked at a metallurgical and manufacturing company and later at a chemistry lab of a regional environmental protection agency. There he helped to develop analysis methods for hazardous air pollutants, which were later incorporated into nationwide standards. After moving to the United States, he earned a Master's of Science degree at the University of Pittsburgh and worked at an energy company and in an environmental testing lab. We are happy to have him at Chemavisor now, where he helps us understand regulations in Russia and other Eastern European and Asian countries. Thank you, Nathan, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this presentation. Like Nathan mentioned, our goal today is to provide you with basic understanding of the government regulations in Russia. I'm not going to give you too many details on specific issues, so you don't get confused with the details you may never need. First, I'd like to point out Russia's place in the world in comparison to other countries. As you can see on the map, Russia is located in Northeast Asia and easternmost part of Europe. With such large territory, Russia is the largest country in the world. Spanning large distance from east to west, country has 11 time zones, from Kaliningrad, which is only one hour ahead of London, all the way to Kamchatka and Chukotka, which is only a few hours behind Alaska. Most of its 146 million people live in the European part and along the south border of the Asian part. The country is number 10 in the world in population size. Last year GDP of about 1.4 trillion dollars brought Russia into 12th place in the world compared to other countries. Russia has relatively developed industry, which contributes about 4.5% to the world's total industrial output. Similar to many other countries, Russia has three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislative part is a parliament consisting of two chambers, Duma, which is uh, an old Russian word for thinking, and the Council of the Federation. Duma consists of 450 members, while the Council consists of 170 people. Again, similar to many other countries. Each chamber has its official website, but I didn't see their English versions. The executive branch consists of the president and the government. I'm sure with all the news we hear today, everybody knows that Russian president is Vladimir Putin. The president's administration has a website, notice the address here, kremlin.ru. Federal government website is government.ru, and it has an English version, if you'd like to read it. The government is led by the Prime Minister, who is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Duma. The term Prime Minister is widely used, but it is not an official term. The legal term can be translated from Russian as chairperson of the government. Presently, the chairperson of the government is Dmitry Medvedev. He used to be the President in 2008-2012 when Vladimir Putin was a Prime Minister. There are 31 other members of the federal executive government. Each of them is in charge of a certain government entity, ministry, agency, or service. Each level of the government issues certain types of legislative document. For example, at the level of parliament and president, we have federal laws. Each law is introduced and voted on by the parliament and signed by the president. 
examples of relevant to us are here. Environmental protection, sanitary, epidemiological, well-being of the population, and so on. Each law is identified by a name, date it was signed in a law, and the number, which is the number of documents issued so far in a year. Also, two letters are added, those Cyrillic FZ, or sometimes you can see Latin FZ, which means federal law. Federal laws define basic provisions and requirements, while specifics are added by lower-level legislative documents. On the le next level down is legislation by the federal government, decrees, decisions, and resolutions. Those documents are signed by the Prime Minister. One of the most frequently updated regulations here is the list of illegal drugs. Each year, sometimes more than once, newly identified drugs are being added to this publication. Similar to federal laws, the government decrees are identified by the name, date, and number. Next level down, we have specific ministries. They introduce regulation within area of their jurisdiction. For example, Ministry of Agriculture published requirements for fishery water quality. Transportation Ministry implements intergovernmental agreements through its own decrees. Those intergovernmental treaties include UN level agreements, as well as agreements between neighboring countries. And finally, perhaps most important for us, for us is the Ministry of Industry and Trade, which develops standards we'll be talking about later. Further down, we have federal agencies. Some agencies are incorporated within ministries, while others are individual entities on the same level as ministries. For example, the Agency on Technical Regulation is a part of Ministry of Industry and Trade. And this agency uh, develops ghost standards, which we'll discuss later. The Agency on Consumer Rights Protection, on the other hand, is an agency on its own, without superior ministry. This agency develops so-called hygienic normatives, which are chemical safety requirements for various media, like air and water. Sometimes the jurisdictions of agencies and ministries shift. For example, the Federal Fishery Agency used to publish uh, quality norms for fishery waters, but recently this jurisdiction was moved up to the Superior Ministry, Minister of Agriculture. So let's look more closely at hygienic normatives developed by uh, Agency on Consumer Rights Protection. The Russian short name for the agency is Rospotrebnadzor, and here is how they translated the name in English. The agency head is called the Chief State Sanitary Physician of the Russian Federation. Uh, I realize the name may not make sense, but this is how they have it on their website, which has an English version. So the normatives are concentration limits for regulated substances in various media, such as air, water, soil, and so on. Each publication has a name and a number. Cyrillic letters here are abbreviation for hygienic normatives. Numbering corresponds to an area, whether it's soil, air, occupational exposure, or residential settings, and so on. The last number corresponds to the year of publication. This agency used to be a part of the Ministry of Health, but its status was elevated in 2004 uh, to that of an independent agency.
Another relevant agency is the Agency on Technical Regulating and Metrology. Russian term is Rostandard, which is an abbreviation for Russian Standard. This agency is a part of the Ministry of Industry and Trade. It develops ghost standards and technical regulations. There are a lot of different ghost standards dealing with a variety of processes and activities. Some regulate production processes, others establish requirements for product progress, some deal with safety, and so on. A few relevant examples are here. Standard on classification of chemicals, specification of products, occupational exposure limits for some chemicals, procedures for testing product and reporting results, and yes, a standard about standards. Agency's website is here. There is an English version. But like in many cases, uh, these have less information or not the same number of pages as the Russian version. Let's look at ghost standards in a bit more detail. The term is a Russian abbreviation for государственный стандарт, meaning state or government standard. The first standard appeared in 1925, when a committee on standardization was organized. This committee still exists, performing pretty much the same role. During the time of USSR, all standards developed by this committee were mandatory for all entities in the country. Here is the front page of a typical standard. This one was introduced in 1976. The period from 1990 to 1993 was marked by great political and economic chaos with eventual disappearance of the country, Soviet Union. This led to many struggles in the regulatory area as well. Standards, as many other laws, were not exactly followed by market participants at the time. Even legislature was not clear. For example, in 1990, a law was introduced declaring that some parts of ghost standards are no longer mandatory. Efforts to straighten standardization brought results only by the period of economic and political stability, by late 90s and early 2000s. In the period 1996 and 97, a term technical regulation was introduced. A term was assigned to mandatory parts of standards. By 2002, the term technical regulation became widely used and the federal law on technical regulation was passed. In 2015, a law on standardization brought more clarity on technical regulations thus bringing st standardization system back on strong footing. More than 25,000 standards are known today. Introduction of technical regulations to complement and replace ghost standards also serves to advance a long-standing idea of reducing the large number of standards by replacing them with smaller number of simpler but more en encompassing and mandatory technical regulations. When Soviet Union broke apart, newly formed independent countries faced many difficulties. Most realized that economic troubles could be alleviated by cooperation among neighbors. Thus, many former Soviet republics retained USSR ghost standards and formed an intergovernmental council to manage the, the existing and develop new standards. Today, ghost standards are considered international standards. When standards are published, the publication lists countries that develop this particular standard. For example, this one is adopted by Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Russia and Tajikistan. 
Of course, some national standards do exist as well to reflect local or regional specifics. In case of Russia, such standards are designated as Ghost R. This is in Russian. Official sources of standards exist, but I found it more convenient to access or download text of standards through a number of private organizations. A few examples are here. Vast majority of ghost standards can be downloaded free of charge, but they will be only in Russian. Some organizations offer translated versions of ghost uh, standards for a fee. As I mentioned, in the 90s, the standards were less and less enforced. And then eventually it was officially recognized that standards are to be followed only voluntarily. For example, this is a certificate for a product which says that the product conforms to requirements set forth by GOS standard. A sign of the certification system says voluntary certification. Many GOS standards are now complemented by technical regulations. One of the distinctions between costs and technical regulation is that while costs are developed and issued by an agency, remember this slide, Agency on Technical Regulating and Metrology, which is a part of the Ministry of Industry and Trade, the technical regulations are introduced by a government decree. For example, the government decree number 1019, issued last October, introduced a technical regulation on safety of chemical products. So those regulations are introduced at a higher level and are generally mandatory in their entirety. A few examples of technical regulations are here. As you can see, they all deal with safety in particular area. So, next we are going to look at international cooperation. As I mentioned, ever since the disappearance of the Soviet Union, newly formed countries realized the need for cooperation and tried to create some organizations. Most notable examples are here. Some are only symbolic organizations, others became extinct by now. The first one is the Commonwealth of Independent State which included all the former USSR republics except the Baltic nations. This organization still exists, but I'm not aware of any significant activity that it does. For others, I'm not even sure what, what their current status is. However, the best functioning organization is the customs union between the following five countries, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia. Until recently, this customs union included only Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Armenia and Kyrgyzstan joined recently, maybe a year or so ago. This customs union is the real deal. Goods move between the participating countries tariff-free. The rules of import and export are unified throughout the countries and tariff income is distributed among the budget of participating countries. But it also goes beyond customs. People can move relatively freely and much business documentation is accepted throughout the participating countries. But the most important aspect here is technical regulations. Similar to what we discussed about technical regulations in Russia, there are technical regulations of the customs union. They are developed by an intergovernmental panel at the Eurasian Economic Commission, which also creates other legislative documents of the union. Those technical regulations are equally valid in all participating countries. This is the site of the organization. It has most of the documents and related information in languages of all five participating countries, plus in English. <coughs> so
So let's look at a few examples. Regulation describes certain products and groups of products for which there are special requirements, such as restrictions for import, requirements to register products before importing, and requirements to certify products conformity with the regulations. For example, if a product falls into a group requiring certification, it must be accompanied by certificate, like this. It shows that the product was tested by a qualified organization or testing lab, and the product corresponds to the requirements set forth by an applicable technical regulation. And here are some examples of technical regulation by the customs union. Most of them deal with safety, but there are some defining product specifications as well. <coughs> Here is an example of certain products subject to uh, different levels of regulations. Some products are completely banned entry into the customs territory. You probably don't have to worry about this group since it mostly includes substances banned for manufacture and use by various international treaties such as Montreal Protocol, Stockholm Convention and so on. Illegal drugs are here as well. The next group is most heavily regulated among the things you can actually import into the customs union. Ozone depleting substances, pesticides, those that are not completely banned, require a licensed entity to manufacture and import. There are also requirements to notify the government on the movement of those substances within the customs union. Some substances even require periodic updates on their inventory even if they are not transported. As far as I know, all this stems from international treaties and should not be much different from other countries. What might be different is those last two groups. The first one requires to register the product with the government. The procedure involved submission of documentation to the government along with samples to a qualified organization. Which, which then determines that the product can be registered. The certificate of registration is required when selling the product. The second group requires a bit more paperwork and probably more product samples to test. In this process, not only a product itself is evaluated, but also the whole manufacturing process used to make the product. So you'll need to provide information about your organization and the production process. We can summarize the steps one needs to take in order to import a product to Russia. First, one needs to determine product tariff code. Since all regulations mention tariff codes, subject to the regulation. Then you need to look for regulation describing whether this tariff code falls under any restriction, registration, or certification requirement. Then there might be some regulations describing requirements for products, even though a product may not need registration or certification. Of course, national regulations still exist often in addition to the customs union regulations. Finally, a chemical product requires an SDS, which we'll talk about in a minute. Here are some resources I find useful when working with uh, uh, tariff codes. Again, those are uh, commercial organizations, not official government sources, but they did a better job presenting this information. Also, Customs Union itself provides a good way of searching uh, for documents. As I mentioned before, it has a lot of them. As I mentioned before, it has a lot of information in English. Finally, I'd like to briefly mention about the safety data sheet. 
The SDS is known in Russia as a safety passport of a chemical product. The SDS must be in Russian language. Its structure is similar to the GHS recommended structure. The major difference from other countries is that Russian SDS has a time limit on its validity, five years, and it needs to be registered with the government. Otherwise, it is not valid and cannot be used. The registration is relatively simple and straightforward process as long as the SDS is composed exactly as required by regulations. And here are those regulations relevant to authoring a safety uh, passport. Those are ghost standards on classification, labeling and transportation requirements and rules on former of the SDS. There are other recommendations issued by the same agency on how to make an SDS with examples. Those standards claim compliance with GHS recommendations versions 1 to 4, but few discrepancies exist, such as phrases and other minor things. It has been announced that with the technical regulation on uh, safety of chemical products, SDS, classification, and labeling will be in full alignment with the most recent GHS revision. However, this regulation will not be enforced until 2021. It is likely that GHS will have new revisions by then, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. There is an organization in charge of GHS adoption in Russia. It is Coordinating Informational Service Center. It was created to help businesses to comply with the new regulations. Presently, this organization also conducts SDS registration, and here is its website. Uh, they also help with SDS authoring by providing exact templates on how an SDS should look like. There is an English version of the website, but it may not have the exact same information as the Russian site. Anyways, it is worth checking out. And that is all I prepared for today's presentation. Hope you find this presentation useful and not too confusing. We have some time for a few questions uh, now and uh, will be available for questions or specific requests later and any time in the future. And thank you very much for your attention.